I made the wrong decision that at the right time that turned out to be the right decision as well. So, which was the armed robbery to go back to prison. It was, as I say, the best thing I ever did. I was the youngest of six. I had uh, two brothers, three sisters, um, quite a large family. My mum and dad had me quite late. They were they were 40 and 39, I believe, when they had me. Um, and from what I can kind of recall, um, it, it was a, a happy childhood. And most of what took place really was outside the home. Um, at the age of eight, um, I, I suffered a, it's quite a weird, looking back, it seems quite weird now that, um, it, it lasted for a year. I, I was sexually abused by this toy shop owner um, that included a bit later on down the line a, a good friend of mine as as well. We were both only eight years old, so what did we know? But we um, we we still went back for some strange reason. Um, but then I, I assume that's what um, grooming is all about um, to to obviously take advantage of kids in that way. Not long after that, I contracted meningitis. Um, which um, I actually, I was only 10 years old then and, and in my last year of, of junior school. Uh, uh, and I, I, I remember that, um, I mean, a lot of my family actually, uh, we had a senior nurse in the family, my auntie Lorraine, and she's always said that the, the meningitis from there on in, that was when, um, if you like, I turned into a devil child. Um, and however, no one knew about the abuse that was that, that happened um, previously. So for me, I, I kind of at that age, I kind of blamed my illness and allowing myself to be abused. After the, after the abuse as well, like I say, I, I didn't really deal with that until very late on in life. So my family wasn't aware of that. So they just assumed that it was the meningitis um, that was the start of me going off the rails because it wasn't long after coming out of hospital and recuperating at home, um, that I was arrested for the first time um, and so begun my four year, uh, 40 year relationship with the criminal justice system in all its forms. So I was off the rails, I really was. Um, from the age of from the age of 10, I, I, I really was off the rails. I was already ever indoors. Um, I'd run away for a couple of nights. Uh, I, I, I was just, yeah, I just, and then when I got expelled from school, um, because all my mates, obviously, my age, were at school. Um, the ones that weren't, the ones that had been expelled along with me, or, or not along with me, but had been expelled as well. So um, I didn't really have anyone to hang about, hang about with other than the guys that I used to hang about with in the evenings after school and at weekends, and it was weekends when we used to get up to lots of... Oh, we were terrible. We were... We were uh, commercial burglaries, TICs, take, uh, t TDA, sorry, uh, taking driving away, nicking cars. But we were nicking cars and we were getting them scrapped and getting money that way, um, taking them to other parts of like areas. And, and we, were used, we used to go out into the countryside and we used to um, find all the old abandoned buildings and take the roof tiles off and get £1.25 for them. And we're talking like early 80s. So um, that was a lot of money then. Um, I mean, we, we were just constant. And as I got, obviously, as I kind of got kicked out of school and as I was available during the day, I then got involved in ID for, for, uh, fraud and theft, uh, kiting. Uh, and we're talking for people that were kind of, what, 15, 20 years older than me. I was just full on downhill. Um, and as I, by that age, I'd even committed my first armed robbery. I mean, we, we were just... We, I, I was really, <laughs> I was out of, I was out of control. Um, I was out of control. My behaviour um, got worse exponentially, I suppose. Um, and by the time I was 14, I was kicked out. Uh, and then by the time I was 15, I was placed into the care of the local authority uh, in a children's home in Kent um, after starting off in the secure unit there. Uh, and then I got put in after... That I, was, I was sent to the detention centre um, when I was 15 for four months. Um, so they called it shock, sharp shock. 
Um, and after three weeks, I loved the place. When I landed there, um, you, you stood on this drain in, outside the front of the, the, the main building uh, in the courtyard. And then you know, I had this, he was quite camp as well. He's quite a chubby camp MO, but he was an evil because um, you have to call him sir. Um, you really did just become an, a number and a name. Uh, it's like LA5990 breaks, but I'll never forget my number from then. And uh, every time I, I forgot to call him so, he'd, he'd either smack me with the palm of his, uh, like the hard bit of his palm in my stomach, uh, underneath that, that bone under, by your ribs, or he'd clamp me around the back of the head. And the thing was, in them days, you, you, uh, the police um, would take your ear there and everywhere. So I had these two old Bill, and one of them who, who hated me, hated my cousins as well. He had got out first and had a word with the guy. So he's obviously told him that I had an attitude and I needed his attitude taken out of me. Um, so, yeah, that was, and I won't lie, um, when I got put on the induction uh, wing uh, and put behind my door, I cried. I, I cried myself to sleep that night. But like I said, after a while, um, I think I was in about a week and then two of my mates come in. I was like, no way. <laughs> and they were people I'd gone to school with. And they were also... Um, where I went to school, it was called Cunningham High School in Ramsgate. And at the back of it was, a, you got Jackie Baker's, and on the corner of Jackie Baker's is something called the Northwood Retreat. And that was like a crew. Um, it was just this, this um, like a sh long shed uh, with windows in it. And it was a pretty, it was, it, was, it was mad. I mean, we just terrorised the place. We, I was in there with the wrong people, and we ended up terrorising the place. It only lasted two weeks, and that was it. They just literally gave up on me, the education system. Um, and I ended up going to a, a special school at probation, which didn't really last long until I ended up in children's life. I look back and I think, I haven't got a clue what anyone could have done. Um, I, I was on this path, I was on this road and, and, and until I decided myself to get off of it. My mum died three weeks after my 21st birthday, so that really did take me, in a way I don't think that was something I ever dealt with either because uh, I felt a lot of guilt because of the way I was when I was younger. Uh, she died of a heart attack at 59, uh, two days before her 60th birthday. Um, and then my dad died a few years later, so I lost them really quite young. Um, and I, I don't really, I, again, it wasn't something I ever really dealt with. It was just something that I, I decided to push away because I had a life to get on with. There were things I needed to get on with. And then our family, my family, as much as I pushed them away, uh, we drifted even further apart. It's because of my own sort of selfish, irresponsible uh, behaviour over the years and the decisions that I made um, is why I'm in this position, or in that position, if you like. The, the admiration, the love, the respect was coming from my peers. And unfortunately, my peers were older people involved in crime. Um, and anyone my age that I hung around with were people that, were also involved in that life because they'd also been excluded from school. Um, I suppose, again, looking back, um, I know a lot of people say that, that kind of drugs are the gateway into more drugs and into alcohol and, and, and so on and so forth, which leads into crime. But for me, it's more the trauma. Um, the tra Not just the trauma, because that wasn't... It was the trauma, if you like, that separated me from my family. Um, but that wasn't their fault. That, was, that wasn't my fault either. Um, it was just a reaction of what happened to me at a young age. Um, so I kind of, I'm, I was the one, if you like, that put the barriers up, that, that everything was anti-me. I probably made a lot more of it back then than I, than I possibly should have done. Um, but then... I didn't know. I was I was a kid. <laughs> I wasn't. I was emotionally mature enough to be able to deal with things like that. When that feeling from that behaviour is good, it validates that behaviour every single time. Uh, and of course, after a while, it becomes habit. And you're no longer committing um, crime. You're you're um, you're living a life with your mates. You're 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 involved. You're you're, you're doing what it is that you want to do regardless. And, and again, there's, it's like, well, what about the consequences, people say? Well, you don't think of the consequences because the consequences of my need far outweigh any other consequence of any action that I took from that, from, from gaining that need. And that need was 
being a part of something, being a part of something bigger than me, if you like. A lot of adults my age back then, <laughs> um, their parents would have had drinks cabinets with um, your avocado, uh, avocado and uh, your cherry brandy and Cinzano martini and all of that nasty, horrible stuff. Um, and that was kind of, I suppose, you have mates come round, it's ah, like, oh, and, 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 and that's how it is. It's not peer pressure, it's just, it's what you do, isn't it? You're, you're all in it together. So that's how it began. And then it, um, it kind of, if you like, moved on to, uh, <laughs> funny story, I, I was drinking in the pub for, for a number of years. And um, on my 18th birthday, I was actually in Dover Borstal, uh, sorry, Dover Youth Custody. And um, my sister, next one up, Tina, she had, she had uh, gone into the local and paid off my beer tab. And the barman obviously said, the landlord said, oh, what's that for? So I was paying it off for David's 18th birthday. He went, 18th birthday? He went, he's been drinking here for a year. We, I was going in my school uniform, do you know what I mean? But it was, it was one of those sort of pubs. It was a proper spit and sawdust pub. I mean, his wife left him, uh, caught. I was out then and his wife had left him. And he had spent, mo he spent most of his time on the end of the bar like that. And it'd be near enough, the pub would be open 24 seven and he wouldn't have moved. My, my, my brothers and my dad uh, were bookmakers. My dad had his own shop. Um, I remember when I was growing up, so a bit of time was spent there. So again, you're around gambling. And then it, my dad was also part of, uh, they, there was an organization called Monarch and they were the suppliers of the pool tables and fruit machines and jukeboxes in the area and into all the pubs. And my dad ran the local pool league um, in, in Thanet. So a lot of people, um, sorry, a lot of people, a lot of my life was either spent down at Ramsgate Seafront with my mum my, my dad upstairs playing bingo, um, at home with my sister, um, or I'd be at a, a pub at some event uh, where they're playing pool. So pubs, gam, all that sort of, <laughs> all that side of the life, that was all there as well. I mean, the, the stereotypical, uh, sorry, the psychologist, or I'd be ticking off the stereotypical box there that, um, I was brought up around alcohol. Obviously, it was the 70s, uh, 80s. Everything was around the pub in them days as well. Um, so alcohol really wasn't, it wasn't a crutch at all. It did become a crutch, but it was, it was what we all did. It had been um, hash, because uh, there wasn't a lot of weed about back then. Uh, in the late 80s, it was mainly hash, and, and sort of you had squiggy black and lead, which was cheaper. Um, and, but that was really it. Um, the guys that I hang about with smoking, but I mean, they, they were a couple of, uh, one of them was the local Ardner. Um, and I, it got to a point where I used to well, my, uh, do a paper round, me and my mate Mark, we used to have a paper round and we used to go around to this house and we'd have a bomb before we go out and do our paper round. That's how, that's how mad it was. We were just kids then. Um, so it, it was something, again, it was something like alcohol being around. So it weren't really an issue. Um, there was no hard drugs about. The hard drugs didn't really come until later on in life. Um, but that kind of started off with, with amphetamine, um, a few, an ecstasy. So really the drug side of it was, was I suppose, a progress over the years. Um, that moved on with the times as well. So after that, it turned into cocaine. Uh, with cocaine, I ended up getting onto crack. And at one point when I was living in London, um, just around the corner, Hornsey, just down the road from Finsbury Pub, I was working in a crack laundry, washing it up with Yardy. So um, that, if you like, that smoking it was what got me into that part. Um, and then sort of got involved in a bit of dealing, it didn't really last long. Uh, and and in 2004 was really when I went off the rails and I ended up getting done for quite a couple of serious, uh, I'd already been lucky once in 2002 on a serious assault uh, against uh, the police as well as uh, an individual. I, I was lucky on that one and it was a couple of years later uh, and again it was, it was just everything coming out, it was just 
it was just coming out in the wrong way. Um, I couldn't handle alcohol. I was horrible on alcohol. Um, drugs, I was fine. I was brilliant on drugs. Um, I was a great person. I loved myself on drugs. So really, I suppose um, a lot of my life was spent um, outside of reality and out of my nut. Uh, I had a working life uh, and a normal life for, for, for a number of years, but there was still stuff going on other way while I was involved in kind of that life, like the crack factory and things like that, crack laundry. So, um, yeah, and then uh, heroin wasn't really something until later on in life. Um, and that, if you like, I suppose, took over as the, the drug of choice along with cannabis, weed. Uh, but it was never injection. I mean, whether it makes a difference or not, I don't know in respect of um, uh, perspectives, but I never used to inject. I, I used to smoke. Um, hence why I've got less less teeth than <laughs> a 30 year old cogwheel. I, I kind of got institutionalized to prison back in 2005 when I become a mentor for the Shannon Trust uh, and then I become a listener for the Samaritans and that really did give me the understanding of what giving back meant, what empathy was um, and it also showed me how I could use my lived experience to help others. Unfortunately, it took place in a prison environment and I was already comfortable in that environment. So therefore, not only did it make me more comfortable, it also validated that comfort, if that makes sense, which um, obviously I suppose there is the term for institutionalized. Um, and I assume that I was because um, I, I, I kind of, everything I was doing, everything I was learning, everything I was studying was all about in prison it was all about helping guys in prison it had nothing to do with being out here at all this is going to sound quite weird because i wasn't still ready for society um and i, I was fighting with society and against society um if you like um and then when i found myself basically on my ass at rock bottom with absolutely nothing um i realized that there was only one place for me to go to Enable, to enable me to be able, not just to sort my life out for the present, but to give me the necessary, not, not skills, because I had the skills, but to sort me out. Um, and not only that, I realized as well that um, it wasn't uh, recidivism that was an issue. It wasn't reoffending that was an issue. It was my love for prison that was an issue. Um, and that was, if you like, the open string that I needed to cut. After I got sent to prison uh, in 2008, um, I, I, I'd refused to be arrested and I ended up on a six, six and a half hours armed siege with the police. I mean, I was proper off my rock. And the only reason why I gave myself up is like, uh, there was, a, there was an officer there, um, officer Collinsworth, who I got on really well with. And he was the only one that could ever talk me down from things. And, um, he had even said to me that, look, uh, he, he I, I'd said to him that, Prison does me no purpose. It's not serving me a purpose. I need help, mate. I need help. I need help. Don't. And I, I had agreed to give myself up on the basis that I get um, under the mental health section under mental health act. And uh, but it never happened. Uh, I ended up in prison. They put me on this offender substance abuse program. And while we were doing that, they were we had to do this timeline of when we first started drinking. And it sort of, if you like, opened up. Pandora's box. We got to a point and, and I just it couldn't stay in anymore and I and I just burst into tears. I then went on this uh course with a Canadian counsellor called Elaine, and it was about 13 weeks I was on it for. And it was one of the best things I ever did. Um I I was able to get quite a lot out. Um and obviously counsellors don't offer advice, they can't offer advice. Um, so it really was, and then at the end of each session, I was absolutely shattered. Um, it, I, I'd got to the, it got to a point where it was that hour session after 50 minutes, I'd be like, alone, look, I've got, I've gone. We get on to 2010, um, and I was under a clinical psychologist up in, in Norwich. And he was the first one that I've, I've really trusted felt comfortable with he he ended up diagnosing me with a number of personality disorders but 
it did envelop me at first, um, but it also gave me not reasons, not excuses, but it gave me something to work with. It gave me some kind of when I look back um, and when I looked into the effects of trauma as well, alongside the personality disorders, it's not, oh, great, I've got that's it. They're the reasons why none of that was my fault. At the end of that, I'm still responsible for the actions that I, I've taken over my life and the decisions that I've, I've made. And, and I accept res full responsibility for that. But there are um, underlying features as to why I was how I was. But again, I still had a lot of stuff to deal with. I still, it was a case of, uh, I come out, uh, I did the drink again, uh, everything would go out the window. I wasn't committed to myself. I wasn't committed to what it was that I wanted to. I even tried moving to Wales. Uh, and I moved to South Wales in a place called Tyler's Town. And within weeks, I was in HMP Cardiff. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then it was from Cardiff that I got judging chambers. I was on remand and I got judging chambers bell. Moved to my daughter's um, back home. Um, and then got right involved in, in drugs, in, in commercials, in violence debt collector oh, it was it was it was just yeah again it was just stupid and um, it was all of those decisions and then in 2015 i'd gone back to uh norwich with a former partner that all fell apart within days two days and then i was on the streets uh and 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 then as i say it was a build up to that to the armed robbery and me going back to prison When I found myself basically on my ass at rock bottom with absolutely nothing, um, I realised that there was only one place for me to go to enable to enable me to be able not just to sort my life out for the present, but to give me the necessary not not skills because I had the skills, but to sort me out. Um, and it made me also realise that well, if that's the place that I can go back to. Um, in order to sort myself out. I'm, I'm if you like, um, in other people's eyes, taking a step back um, to move myself forward. What must my perspective of prison be? Um, because it's not the sort of place you want to go to voluntarily, which is in a way what I did. The, the crime itself, which was armed robbery, um, I'm again ashamed of, but it was a means to an end. And um, the, the uh, if you like, the victim was more an object than he was a human being. He, he was my hurdle, uh, my, ob my, my obstacle, if you like, for, for me to be able to sort my life out. So um, as much as I felt bad about that, um, it was something I needed, I needed to do. I mean, I was, I was out my nut anyway. So, I mean, it's not, it's very easy to say, well, that wasn't very rational thinking. Well, of course it wasn't. I mean, I wasn't in a rational frame of mind and I wasn't in a fresh, in a rational situation. So um, it was, it was, for me, it was an easy decision to make. I knew that I would need a long enough time in order to sort myself out. So low level crimes were out the window, but then I needed to be very careful because, because of my history. Um, Obviously, there wasn't IPP about in 2015. You had, I think, was it um, EDS, the Extended um, Determinate Sentence. Um, so I was very much in risk of that, and, and I was probably um, very close to a discretionary life as well. So, I mean, there were, it was a very, very risky game to play. Um, however, for me, it wasn't because um, it was an opportunity for me to win win. Um, I either got the right amount of time or, or close to it um, to enable me to sort myself out or I get myself a life sentence um, and with with the prospects I had the future that um, I didn't have um, that wasn't such a bad prospect at the time I, I was after being sentenced I got sentenced in the October um, and the judge I went guilty uh, I, I got through to pleas and case management here and um, I offered to go guilty and um, he appreciated me going guilty um, and accepted what I was saying about the victim and um, 
he said the normal starting point for this crime is seven years. However, because you've gone guilty today, uh, because you went guilty, sorry, um, I'm going to start it at five years. And because you've gone guilty at the first available opportunity, uh, sorry, at, at the opportunity, uh, when you went guilty at the point you did, um, he took 25% off. So I ended up getting three year, nine month, um, which ironically <laughs> was about six months short of what I wanted. I would have been quite happy had he stayed at the five year. Well, I, I mean, I went to prison rock bottom. Um, by the time I banged up that first night, the only thing that I had in my life at that moment was a pair of boxer shorts and a pair of socks that I owned um, that I come in with. The rest was prison clothes. Um, I was homeless. I didn't have any of my stuff with me when I was arrested, apart from the clothes I was wearing, which obviously they took away for forensics. Um, and um, <laughs> ironically, gave when I got sentenced, gave me 28 days to collect them. <laughs> So they obviously ended up being destroyed. In Norwich prison, you've got three parts. You've got the main prison um, and you've got F and G wing, which is the old wire. There, there's four parts because you've got healthcare and a, a life as respite unit. And, uh, but there's also F and G, which is the old YOI. And normally the, it's called the local discharge unit. It's just a dumping ground basically. And it was there for people doing less than 12 months in the local discharge, hence local discharge unit. So really with three years, nine months, I shouldn't have gone over there, but I was a listener, I was a rep, uh, I was a St. Giles peer advisor. Um, and I'd gone over there because I heard about the drug smuggling over there, how um, it was not just, not so much easy, um, but it was quite lucrative. I've, I actually got myself over there and I, I managed within 20 minutes of landing, getting myself involved with the people, that were doing what they were doing. So it all come on top. Uh, and coincidentally, it all come on top the day that I was given my decaf. Uh, so um, I'd basically gone from uh, an enhanced decaf who was a listener, uh, a rep, a St. Giles peer advisor, um, within no time, back to BCAT conditions and on basic for five weeks. But it taught me a lesson. Um, it made me realise, and it really did validate my, my thoughts on prison. Yeah, I needed to change myself for the outside, and prison was that place for me to be able to do that. I'd thought about the part of me being able to utilise the resources in prison for me to turn my life around. Um, I'd forgotten about dropping the side of me in jail um, that gets up to no good. When it got to that point uh, in 2016, March 2016, as I say, it all come crashing down to me. It made me realise that I could. There's no in between. There's no if, buts, or maybes. If you're going to change, you've got to change. I also had to hit rock bottom in society, then hit rock bottom in what I considered was my 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 environment, my comfort zone, um, before I really was um, in a position to. to and, and to, to move on and um, I mean my intentions were still right in prison I was still doing the right things it was just I was still dodgy <laughs> um, and I was I, I, I'd even I ended up getting a just before I got um, booted back into a BCAT um, I, I'd literally a few days before been awarded a prisoner recognition award um, for the way I was so I was still doing the right things um, as I said I was still at it but um, again one of the best lessons I learned that was um, that you can't half chain um, in a way it was kind of uh, taking Dave into prison and bringing David out if that makes sense I kind of separated the two people into two characters and it was like right let's leave it in there and bring out the guy who I'd become in jail which was a guy with more tolerance more patience more understanding more empathy. The only, <laughs> the only problem that I'd had in the past was the way that I was trying to deal with authority. I was still along the lines of, see you, this shouldn't be happening, rah, 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 rah. And, and that's why I'd done the degree because I wanted to learn their language. I wanted to, not their language, but I wanted to learn how they do it with their language and, and, and how they construct arguments or how I could construct an argument that would utilize my lived experience because it'd be pointless me wasting my lived experience now. I looked at trans uh, transactional analysis with sort of the adult, the parent and the child that we all have inside us. Um, I looked at uh, 
uh, walked to Michelle the marshmallow test, which was all about delayed gratification, because obviously it was going to be a bit of time before I could get out and get to work. Uh, NLP, which was more about how NLP was created based on their um, examination, investigation of people at the top of their game. And it was all about modeling. So it, it was it was kind of, um, uh, I was looking for, what, and NLP as well taught me how to deal with my issues and deal with the voices, deal with the pictures, deal with those images that you have in your head by ways of um, getting in sort of, not so much my learning style, but how I think. Uh, and, and if it's audio, to kind of turn that volume down, and if it's if it's visual, to to make that picture smaller, and it and it kind of worked. I mean, it was really working. I, I was into med meditation. Um, I tried yoga, but I get knackered jumping to conclusions and, and and kind of hurt myself. So I gave yoga a miss, but I kept meditation. Um, and and all of that combined, and and one of them as well was. Um, Rhonda Byrne, The Secret, uh, which was Ask, Believe, Receive, and how we're our own antenna and the energy that we put out is what we receive back. And I very much bought into that ethos and, and started to believe, to, to ask. Uh, at night, I used to look out the window and I used to look up to the sky. Tomorrow is going to be a good day. And, and it, it, was, it was incredible how... The, the belief and that confidence allows you um, to pick your own self up and, and provide you, yourself with positive self-talk. But then I also was getting the great positive support from the education department, plus the, the staff on the wings as well. It was as if it's all it had all come together at the right time. I made the wrong decision that at the right time that turned out to be the right decision as well so which was the armed robbery to go back to prison 2017 i come out of jail um but i didn't grow up until that um situation in in hmp norwich in march 2016 when i got involved in drug smuggling and trafficking and got caught i went into supported accommodation uh spent 20 months in accommodation before meeting my partner and who i live with now kelly down in Seven Oaks in Kent. I come across this organisation called the National Crime Syndicate uh, dot com, and um, I was going for and and I, I read off. Oh, I just fell in love with this site. It was just oh, it's just the nuts. It was absolute nuts. So a couple of weeks after I've literally drained every tab that was on there and every bit of content, I'd noticed one of these buttons at the bottom, and it said, "Write for us." So I, I checked it out and it said, send in. Like, so I sent in this story. And I, I, I although my confidence, it, it was a new area I was going into. So my confidence was probably as low as what it was in respect of uh, a few years ago of me. Uh, so I, I, was, I was really nervous. And then I got this email back saying, do you know what? That's not a bad story. Though. Uh, and so that was Christmas 2018. Um, and I've been writing articles ever since. Uh, I mean, I've had so many different surreal moments along the way. I, I got to speak at the House of Commons for the Shannon, uh, for Shannon Trust. I was done a TEDx talk at the uh, home of the Open University, Milton Keynes. My talk there was on education makes the impossible possible, uh, and it's about how myself and, and people like myself were able to view prison rather than the end, so it is the beginning, um, and we're able to utilise resources of prison in order to turn our lives around. It's very difficult for me not to look back and think, yeah, that, that was the path I had to take, um, because it's as if every time I open my eyes, there's opportunity. The life that I've been able to create for myself on the back of all of that, um, is for me uh, something that is so, I'd go through it all again, I really would, if I knew this was at the end. Um, and it's on so many different levels, so many different areas. It, it, it's, it's, I don't even know what's going to happen one day to the next. Do you know, I, I say it, I, actually, I still get up at four o'clock in the morning, which is the time I used to get up in prison. And I'm, I'm kind of running down the stairs. Uh, I can't wait to begin my day.